Hello, fifth graders. Welcome to Language Arts for today. For today, you will need your copy of Little Women. You'll need your white binder and you're going to need paper, pencil, or maybe. Again, that's kind of the, uh, if you're using it to help you out. So fifth graders, we are going to get into talking about last homework and today's homework, but um, I just really want to point out, right, these objectives for today. We're going to be working on identifying theme evidence. And we're going to be working on characterizing Amy a little bit. This chapter is really going to focus on Amy. And so by the time we're done, we should have a good idea um, of kind of some areas of growth or weaknesses of Amy's, okay? This theme evidence, this has come up multiple times on homework and is going to continue to come up again and again. A lot of you have been remembering, this would have been, I guess, the Friday before, well, a long time ago now, two, three Fridays ago. But anyway, our first day that we did Little Women, um, we took those notes, right? And we talked about the three themes that we're going to be focusing on. In my lessons, I've been reminding you of those three themes. And so by now, we should be not, we're not kind of inventing our own themes. We're trying to look at the three that have been provided and figure out which one seems to fit where. So again, remember those three themes that we've been talking about. The first one is, or one of them is societal expectations of women. In other words, how did everyone expect women to act at this time? The second one is this relationship between money and happiness, specifically what is that relationship, right? And I've talked a lot in my lessons that some characters really seem to believe if only I had more money, then I'd be happier. Whereas others, and Marmy in particular, is kind of pushing this message of, you know, having money doesn't keep you from unhappiness and, and not having money doesn't keep you from happiness, right? That there's not necessarily a connection between the two. And then finally, this idea of the importance of living a virtuous life and kind of reflecting on why is it important to be virtuous? And this is something that Marmy also continues to communicate with the girls throughout. So when you guys are selecting an answer for those themes, that's what you should be thinking about. One of those three themes. Also, why I'm encouraging you to have your white binder because your notes for those for little women should be in your white binder. And so you can look right there at the options and then pick which one seems to fit the most. I also want to remind you, I'm giving a lot of these answers in the video as I'm going through. So those of you who are watching the lesson and reading along with it, you're finding that it's easier to get your answers correct because you're doing that work. You're sticking with me throughout. Okay. So this is something to keep in mind as we are continuing forward with little women. So we're going to talk about yesterday's homework. I'm going to sort of preview today's homework, and then we're going to get in and start doing the reading for today's lesson. So here we go. So number one, how does Mr. Lawrence scare Beth? We learned that he spoke too loudly, right? He startled her when he said, hey, too loudly. What does he end up giving her? He ends up giving her a piano, right? A cabinet piano, but it's a piano. Three, why does Meg say, I do believe the world is coming to an end? And the correct answer is because Beth went to thank Mr. Lawrence alone. Four and five, you were supposed to be identifying quotes that show character growth in Beth. And I kept kind of pointing things out as I went in order to help you guys pay attention to some of these quotes. So, um... On page 65, the little brown hood slipped through the hedge nearly every day and the great drawing room was haunted by a tuneful spirit that came and went unseen. So we see that she's going over to her neighbors on her own and playing the piano. That certainly shows character growth. Or you see Beth approaching earlier. Oh, sir, they do care very, very much. So she speaks to him, right? Which is also something she would not have done. Or towards the end, we see this... this uh, interaction that the two of them have. She says, or the narrator says, to the utter amazement of the assembled family, Beth walked deliberately down the garden through the hedge and in at the Lawrence's door, okay? Or they would have been still more amazed if they had seen what Beth did afterward. She went and knocked at the study door before she gave herself time to think. And when a gruff voice called out, come in, she did go in. And we see he kind of continues and she goes up and kisses him, right? Those are all great quotes. So Either of those, right? And making sure, again, that with these short answers, we're setting them up in complete sentences as we've been doing all year. And then finally, this creating your own sentence for indolent, right? And this idea that indolent is like lazy or, or inactive, okay? So you were supposed to write a sentence. Remember, it has to be at least six words long, and it has to capture your understanding of the word. So make sure you're checking to see if I made returns and asked for corrections there. 
so for today, number seven, or chapter seven, again, this kind of focuses on Amy. So number one asks, why did Amy get into trouble? Two, to which theme might this relate? Remember the three that I just reminded you of? It's also in your notes, okay? Which of the following was one of Amy's punishments? Four, why didn't Mrs. March like Amy's punishment? Five, why wasn't Mrs. March sorry about Amy's loss? Six, what did Mrs. March say that Amy needed to correct? You can pretty much take a direct quote from the text for this one. And finally, which of the following sentences correctly uses the word ignominious, um, which means humiliating. And again, I provide that definition and many other definitions for you in the instructions of your assignment. Okay, so you can see how our objectives are relating, right? One of your questions is talking about this very thing, themes, and then the other one, we're really understanding Amy and some of these interactions that she's having and what Marmy's telling her as the chapter progresses. So let's go ahead and open up our books and get into chapter seven. It starts on page 69. Amy's Valley of Humiliation kind of relates to that vocabulary word, ignominious. That boy is a perfect cyclops, isn't he? Said Amy one day as Laurie clattered by on horseback with a flourish of his whip as he passed. How dare you say so when he's got both his eyes? And very handsome ones they are too, cried Joe, who resented any slighting remarks about her friend. I didn't say anything about his eyes, and I don't see why you need to fire up when I admire his riding. Oh, my goodness. That little goose means a centaur. And she called him a cyclops, exclaimed Joe with a burst of laughter. So this is another example of Amy trying to speak in a grown-up and sort of educated-sounding way, but making it worse because she doesn't know what she's saying. So to be clear, cyclops is a one-eyed monster in Greek mythology. A centaur would be a creature that has a horse on the bottom half and a man or human body on the top half. And so you could say, if someone's a really great horseback rider, you could say that they're like a centaur because it, they ride as if the horse is kind of like a part of them, right? So Amy's trying to say, he's such a great horseback rider. He's like a centaur. But instead, she calls him a cyclops. And so now Joe's kind of laughing because she's like, what are you talking about? He's got both his eyes. And once she figures out that Amy, uh, once she figured out Amy's mistake, she's laughing about it. You needn't be so rude. It's only a lapse of lingy, as Mr. Davis says, retorted Amy, finishing Joe with her Latin. So the footnote tells us that even here she says lapse of lingy, but she's trying to say the Latin phrase for slip of the tongue. So now Joe's really laughing at her for her misspeaking. I just wish I had a little of the money Lori spends on that horse, she added, as if to herself, yet hoping her sisters would hear. Why, asked Meg kindly, for Joe had gone off in another laugh at Amy's second blunder. I need it so much, I'm dreadfully in debt, and it won't be my turn to have the rag money for a month. So the rag money's kind of like, I mean, it's not an allowance, but think about like that extra money that she could use to spend on what she wants, and they kind of take turns who gets it. In debt, Amy? What do you mean? And Meg looked sober. Why, I owe at least a dozen pickled limes, and I can't pay them, you know, till I have money, for Marmy forbade my having anything charged at the shop. Tell me all about it. Are limes the fashion now? It used to be pricking bits of rubber to make balls, and Meg tried to keep her countenance. Amy looked so grave and important. And so we're going to learn these are kind of like pickled limes, and so likely they're pickled in something and sugared, right? And so they probably come out to be kind of like a chewy sweet or uh, sweet and tart kind of treat so I kind of think of like Sour Patch Kids or something like that right but this is older so this would have been a different kind of chewy lime that's a little bit sugary why you see the girls are always buying them and unless you want to be thought mean, you must do it too it's nothing but limes now for everyone is sucking them in their desks in school time and trading them off for pencils bee rings paper dolls or something else at recess if one girl likes another, she gives her a line. If she's mad with her, she eats one before her face and doesn't offer even a suck. They treat by turns, and I've had ever so many but haven't returned them, and I ought, for they are debts of honor, you know. So you can see, this should be very something similar. If you guys imagine times at, at school, I, I'm confident that some of you know exactly what Amy's talking about, right? It's like if you're at lunch and somebody has 
I don't know, some kind of a treat that everyone wa- wants. And sometimes people are not really necessarily very just, right? So they say, and you can have some of my treat. And you can have some of my treat. And you cannot have any. But you can have some of my treat. And you can have some of my treat. And so you can see they're kind of like being kind or mean to each other with these treats. And so Amy feels like she owes people because they've given them to her and she hasn't returned any of them. How much will pay them off and restore your credit? Asked Meg, taking out her purse. A quarter would more than do it and leave a few cents over for a treat for you. Don't you like limes? Not much. You may have my share. Here's the money. Make it last as long as you can, for it isn't very plenty, you know. Oh, thank you. It must be so nice to have pocket money. I'll have a grand feast, for I haven't tasted a lime this week. I felt delicate about taking any, as I couldn't return them. I'm actually suffering for one. So Amy here, right, is kind of like, oh, it's been very difficult for me. I haven't had a pickled lime all week. Okay. Next day, Amy was rather late at school, but could not resist the temptation of displaying, with pardonable pride, a moist brown paper parcel before she consigned it to the inmost recesses of her desk. So she comes in late to school, but she has this bag, presumably of pickled limes. But Amy kind of comes in so everyone can see it. So she's walking around and making it very clear that she has this bag of limes. So everyone's kind of like, oh, she's got limes. Okay. During the next few minutes, the rumor that Amy March had got 24 delicious limes. She ate one on the way and was going to treat circulated through her set and the attentions of her friends became quite overwhelming. So everyone hears that she's got lime. So now everyone's being so nice to her because they want a lime. So, oh, Amy, oh, Amy, okay. Katie Brown invited her to the next party on the spot. Mary Kingsley insisted on lending her her watch till recess. And Jenny Snow, a satirical young lady who had basely twitted Amy upon her limeless state, promptly buried the hatchet and offered to furnish answers to certain appalling sums. But Amy had not forgotten Miss Snow's cutting remarks about some persons whose noses were not too flat to smell other people's limes and stuck up people who were not too proud to ask for them. And she instantly crushed that Snow girl's hopes by the withering telegram. You needn't be so polite all of a sudden for you won't get any. So we're seeing that Earlier, Jenny Snow had had the limes and Amy had wanted one and Jenny had been mean, right? And said, apparently your nose isn't so flat you can't smell the fact that I've got limes and apparently you're not too proud to ask for them. But now all of a sudden Jenny's saying, oh, Amy, Amy, I I just want some, I'll help you with the math. I just want some limes. And Amy's saying, you don't need to be polite. You're not getting any, okay? A distinguished personage happened to visit the school that morning and Amy's beautifully drawn maps received praise which honor to her foe rankled in the, in the soul of Miss Snow and caused Miss March to assume the airs of a studious young peacock. So Amy feels very proud of herself for her maps that she's drawn. So it's kind of like, oh, thank you. Aren't my maps so wonderful? Okay. But alas, alas, pride goes before a fall and the revengeful snow turns the tables with disastrous success. No sooner had the guest paid the usual stale compliments and bowed himself out than Jenny, under pretense of asking an important question, informed Mr. Davis, the teacher, that Amy March had pickled limes in her desk. Now, Mr. Davis had declared limes a contraband article. Contraband means they're not allowed at school. I know it's been a while since you've been in school, but I bet you can imagine something that your teachers in the past have said. These are outlawed. Things that I have outlawed might be putty, might be Rubik's cubes, not Pokemon cards in fifth grade, but some younger grades have had Pokemon cards outlawed. So those are all examples of contraband articles. And solemnly vowed to publicly ferule. So this is actually kind of reminds us of Ichabod, because he had a ferule, right? And the footnote tells us that, that if you ferule somebody, you're going to strike them on the hand with a flat piece of wood. I imagine a flat piece of wood being something like this. So striking on the hand, okay? Solemnly vowed to publicly ferule the first person who was found breaking the law. Again, you can probably imagine a teacher saying this. The next person 
who I find with limes is going to get, okay, so he's made this declaration. This much enduring man had succeeded in banishing chewing gum after a long and stormy war, had made a bonfire of the confiscated novels and newspapers, had suppressed a private post office, had forbidden distortions of the face, nicknames and caricatures, and done all that one man could do to keep half a hundred rebellious girls in order. Boys are trying enough to human patience, goodness knows. But girls are infinitely more so, especially to nervous gentlemen with tyrannical tempers and no more talent for teaching than Dr. Blinder. Mr. Davis knew any quantity of Greek, Latin, algebra, and ologies of all sorts, so he was called a fine teacher. And manners, morals, feelings, and examples were not considered of any particular importance. It was the most unfortunate moment for denouncing Amy, and Jenny knew it. Mr. Dav Davis had evidently taken his coffee too strong that morning. There was an east wind, which had always affected his neuralgia, and his pupils had not done him the credit which he felt he deserved. Therefore, to use the expressive, if not elegant, language of a schoolgirl, he was as nervous as a witch and as cross as a bear. The word limes was like fire to powder. His yellow face flushed and he rapped on his desk with an energy which made Jenny skip to her seat with unusual rapidity. Young ladies, attention, if you please. At the stern order, the buzz ceased and 50 pairs of blue, black, gray, and brown eyes were obediently fixed upon his awful countenance. Miss March, come to the desk. Amy rose to comply with outward composure, but a secret fear oppressed her for the limes weighed upon her conscience. In other words, she knew she wasn't supposed to have those limes, so it was making her feel guilty. <clears throat> Bring with you the limes you have in your desk, was the unexpected command which arrested her before she got out of her seat. Don't take all, whispered her neighbor, a young lady of great presence of mind. So Mr. Davis has commanded that Amy bring forward her limes, and a neighbor has said, you know, don't bring all the limes, just bring some of them, okay? Give them some, and then that'll be good enough. Amy hastily shook out half a dozen and laid the rest down before Mr. Davis, feeling that any man possessing a human heart would relent when that delicious perfume met his nose. Unfortunately, Mr. Davis particularly detested the odor of the fashionable pickle and disgust added to his wrath. Is that all? Not, not quite, stammered Amy. Bring the rest immediately. With a despairing glance at her set, she obeyed. You are sure there are no more? I never lie, sir. So I see. Now take these disgusting things two by two and throw them out of the window. There was a simultaneous sigh, which created quite a little gust as the last hope fled and the treat was ravished from their longing lips. Scarlet with shame and anger, Amy went to and fro six dreadful times, and as each doomed couple, looking oh, so plump and juicy, fell from her reluctant hands, a shout from the street completed the anguish of the girls, for it told them that their feast was being exalted over by the little children who were their sworn foes. This, this was too much. All flashed indignant or appealing glances at the inexorable Davis, and one passionate lime lover burst into tears. So the first thing Amy does is has to go throw them out, throw the limes out the window, and they can hear other children getting them and celebrating over them. As Amy returned from her last trip, Mr. Davis gave a portentous <clears throat> and said in his most impressive manner, young ladies, you remember what I said to you a week ago. I am sorry that this has happened, but I never allow my rules to be infringed, and I never break my word. Miss March, hold out your hand. Amy started and put both hands behind her, turning on him an imploring look which pleaded for her better than the words she could not utter. She was rather a favorite with old Davis, as of course he was called, and it's my private belief that he would have broken his word if the indignation of one irrepressible young lady had not found vent in a hiss. That hiss, faint as it was, irritated the irascible gentleman and sealed the culprit's face. Your hand, Miss March, 
was the only answer her mute appeal received. And too proud to cry or beseech, Amy set her teeth, threw back her head defiantly, and bore without flinching several tingling blows on her little palm. They were neither many nor heavy, but that made no difference to her. For the first time in her life, she had been struck and the disgrace in her eyes was as deep as if he had knocked her down. So again, we kind of have talked about this, right? This is not something that happens anymore, but at the time it really wouldn't have been uncommon. This idea is called corporal punishment. Remember we talked about this with our notes, corporal coming from the Latin for corpus, which means body. So corporal punishment is punishment that is happening on the body, okay? You will now stand on the platform till recess, said Mr. Davis, resolved to do the thing thoroughly since he had begun. So it's kind of a final thing. She's being made to stand up on this elevated area in front of all of her classmates. That was dreadful. It would have been bad enough to go to her seat and see the pitying faces of her friends or the satisfied ones of her few enemies. But to face the whole school with that same shame fresh upon her seemed impossible. And for a second, she felt as if she could only drop down where she stood and break her heart with crying. A bitter sense of wrong and the thought of Jenny Snow helped her to bear it. And taking the ignominious, remember this is humiliating, place, she fixed her eyes on the stove funnel above what now seemed a sea of faces and stood there, so motionless and white, that the girls found it very hard to study with that pathetic figure before them. So as we're looking, we've kind of already gone through the first three questions. What did, why did she get in trouble? Okay. Two, to which theme would this relate? And so this is kind of an interesting reflection of what happens if someone is not displaying. Now, I wouldn't say that this is how things should go, but there's this idea that there are consequences when someone perhaps is not displaying their virtues all the time. So something to think about for two. And three, which of the following was one of her punishments, okay? So again, there's multiple punishments, but we're looking for just one out of the options that is listed, okay? Okay. During the 15 minutes that followed, the proud and sensitive little girl suffered a shame and pain which she never forgot. To others, it might seem a ludicrous or trivial affair. But to her, it was a hard experience, for during her 12 years of life, she had been governed by love alone. And a blow of that sort had never touched her before. The smart of her hand and the ache of her heart were forgotten in the string of the thought, I shall have to tell at home, and they will be so disappointed in me. How many of you know that experience? I know I did at school, right? It's one thing to get in trouble at school, but then to know that your parents are going to find out about it. <sighs> makes it so much worse, right? And so she's terrified that her parents will find out. The 15 minutes seemed an hour, but they came to an end at last, and the word recess had never seemed so welcome to her before. You can go, Miss March, said Mr. Davis, looking, as he felt, uncomfortable. He did not soon forget the reproachful glance that Amy gave him as she went, without a word to anyone, straight into the anteroom, like the coat room, snatched her things, and left the place forever, as she passionately declared to herself. She was in a sad state when she got home, and when the older girls arrived some time later, an indignation meeting was held at once. Mrs. March did not say much, but looked disturbed, and comforted her afflicted little daughter in her tenderest manner. Meg bathed the insulted hand with glycerin and tears. Beth felt that even her beloved kittens would fail as a balm for griefs like this. Joe wrathfully proposed that Mr. Davis be arrested without delay, and Hannah shook her fist at the villain and pounded the potatoes for dinner as if she had him under her pestle. No notice was taken of Amy's flight except by her mates, but the sharp-eyed demoiselles discovered that Mr. Davis was quite benignant in the afternoon, and so he's being extra kind after that at event. Also, unusually nervous. Just before school closed, Jo appeared wearing a grim expression as she stalked up to the desk and delivered a letter from her mother, then collected Amy's property and departed, carefully scraping the mud from her boots on the doormat, as if she shook the dust of the place off her feet. Yes, you can have a vacation from school, but I want you to study a little every day with Beth, said Mrs. March that evening. I don't approve of corporal punishment, 
That's our answer to number four. And I've talked about that word corporal, especially for girls. I dislike Mr. Davis's manner of teaching and don't think the girls you associate with are doing you any good. So I shall ask your father's advice before I send you anywhere else. That's good. I wish all the girls would leave and spoil his old school. It's perfectly maddening to think of those lovely limes, sighed Amy, with the air of a martyr. I am not sorry you lost them, for you broke the rules and deserved some punishment for disobedience, was the severe reply, which rather disappointed the young lady who expected nothing but sympathy. So that's our answer to number five. Do you mean you are glad I was disgraced before the whole school, cried Amy? I should not have chosen that way of mending a fault, replied her mother. But I'm not sure that it won't do you more good than a milder method. You are getting to be rather conceited, my dear. This is getting to answer number six. And it's quite time to set about correcting it. You have a good many little gifts and virtues, but there is no need of parading them. For conceit spoils the finest genus, genius. There is not much danger that real talent or goodness will be overlooked long. Even if it is, the consciousness of possessing and using it well should satisfy one. And the great charm of all power is modesty. So we see that Mrs. March is talking to Amy about kind of a fault of hers. And this gets to characterizing her a little bit. She tells her that she's conceited, which means that you're thinking excessively highly of yourself. This actually kind of connects to our idea of hubris, right? So conceit, to be conceited is to think too highly of your, yourself. And she's saying to Amy, you don't need to parade around your talents. If you're really talented, people will notice it. And even if they don't, you should just rest assured in knowing that you have these talents. That Amy seems too uh, interested in showing it off. And we saw that today in the chapter, right? There was this described as a peacock, which is kind of like a strutting, showing off peacock, okay? So it is, cried Lori, who was playing chess in a corner with Joe. I knew a girl once had a really remarkable talent for music, and she didn't know it, never guessed what sweet little thing she composed when she was alone, and wouldn't have believed it if anyone had told her. So Laurie's describing someone he knows, a little girl who was really talented at music. So we should kind of be thinking, like, who does Lori know who's really talented at music? I wish I'd known that nice girl. Maybe she would have helped me. I'm so stupid, said Beth, who stood beside him, listening eagerly. So depending on who you thought of before, this should be kind of a, a, a humorous moment, right? You do know her, and she helps you better than anyone else could, answered Lori. So who is Lori talking about, to be really clear? He's talking about Beth, right? And Beth's saying, I wish I knew her. She could help me. So it, Lori answers. Looking at her with such mischievous meaning in his merry black eyes that Beth suddenly, she figures it out, turned very red and hid her face in the sofa cushion, quite overcome by such an unexpected discovery. Joe let Lori win the game to pay for that praise of her Beth, who could not be prevailed upon to play for them after her compliment. So Lori did his best and sang delightfully, being in a particularly lively humor. For, the mar for to the marches, he seldom showed the moody side of his character. When he was gone, Amy, who had been pensive all the evening, said suddenly, as if busy over some new idea, Is Lori an accomplished boy? Yes, he has had an excellent education and has much talent. He will make a fine man, if not spoiled by petting, replied her mother. And he isn't conceited, is he? asked Amy. Not in the least. That is why he is so charming and we all like him so much. I see. It's nice to have accomplishments and to be elegant, but not to show off or get perked up, said Amy thoughtfully. These things are always seen and felt in a person's manner and conversation, if modesty used. But it is not necessary to display them, said Mrs. March, any more than it's proper to wear all your bonnets and gowns and ribbons at once that folks know you've got them, added Joe. And the lecture ended in a laugh. So we're seeing, right, this reflection continuing. That Amy's thinking, so wait, Lori has a lot of accomplishments, but he doesn't walk around bragging and showing off and telling everyone how great he is. And Mrs. March says, yeah, and actually that's part of why we like him so much, because he doesn't do those things, okay? Um, and Joe makes the connection, like, right, you don't have to walk around displaying your talents all the time, telling everyone how great you are all the time. 
She's like, it's as ridiculous as the thought of putting on all the clothes you, you own at once, just so everybody knows, like, these are all the clothes I own, right? And so, again, as we're sort of characterizing Amy, we're sort of realizing this thing about her. And she's learning and thinking about what it means to be modest is the word that her mom uses, but kind of this idea of like humility, right? That you can have talents without showing off about them, okay? So we've touched on all of those answers. And then remember this word ignominious, you're gonna select the vocabulary sentence that makes the most sense there. Or I shouldn't say that makes the most sense, that correctly uses the word. So uh, go ahead, take on those questions. And if you have questions or need help, you let me know. Good luck, fifth graders.